Hello and welcome back to another edition of The Power of Storytelling. My name is Melissa Porras and joining me today is Patrick Lyons. Patrick is an alum from the University of Texas at Austin where he majored in mechanical engineering. Today, Patrick currently works as a mechanical sourcing engineer at Microsoft in their Washington headquarters. Aside from that, Patrick is also the founder of his own Lion Shred coaching program and he also runs his own YouTube channel. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the introduction. Awesome. Uh, Patrick, I have so many questions. I mean, from how you started like your fitness journey, your time, I know for a brief period of time you were training for American Ninja Warrior. I want to hear about your time at UT, but let's backtrack a little bit. And could you actually tell me a little bit about your hometown, what it was like? Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in Carrollton, Texas, which is a suburb just outside of Dallas. Uh, it's about 30 minutes north of downtown Dallas. And it's a, a town of about 120,000 people. Uh, and I loved my upbringing. Like looking back, I have such fond memories of of growing up and of my childhood. Like I had uh, a great friend group from a very young age. I was involved in like, you know, playing soccer from the age of like three years old. So I had all my soccer friends. I did gymnastics when I was in preschool. So I had like my gymnastics friends. And then throughout, you know, middle school, elementary school, even uh, middle school and high school, I was very involved in things like theater and speech and debate. And those became like my, my closest friends, uh, the people who I hung out with inside and outside of school. And yeah, I, I just feel very blessed to have grown up in the area that I did with the parents that I had and with the friends that I had. So that's a bit about uh, my growing up. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, definitely sounds like you had a good community around you. And I guess from your hometown, it's how did that, like, how would you say that sort of transitioned into you when looking at colleges or in high school, realizing, like, coming to realize, like, you would want to do engineering or that you wanted to go to UT? What was that like? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, basically, I found from probably middle school onward that I really gravitated towards, like, math and science. It was like, that was what I was passionate about when it came to academics. but Kind of the funny thing is before eighth grade, I had my sights set on being a musical theater major. I 100% thought I was gonna be on Broadway. That was my, my dream, my goal. And if we go back even a step further than that, the reason why I wanted to be on Broadway uh, was because I wanted to become Batman as a kid. And I thought that if I could have a profession that made what I considered to be an insurmountable amount of money, <laughs> that I could become Batman. And as a kid, I thought that being an actor was the, the answer to that. And so that's why I got involved in theater initially. And I spent all my summers doing, you know, musical theater camps, things like that. But as I got older, I realized that that wasn't as lucrative of like a guaranteed income source as I thought it was. Um, so I unfortunately kind of took a step back from the Batman dream and started pursuing math and science even more. I was already like decent at academics, but I just like really focused on that. Um, and then in high school, same thing, math and science is what I enjoyed the most. So then when I'm looking at colleges, originally I was dead set on Stanford. That was my number one choice. I put all my eggs in that basket. I put, you know, so many hours into those application essays, things like that. I applied early action and I didn't get in. And that was really difficult because I had no other like backup plan that I considered legitimate. Uh, so I basically applied to 23 more schools after that. And that took obviously a lot of time off of like my Thanksgiving and winter breaks, putting together all these essays and uh, all of that. But the reason I ended up choosing the University of Texas at Austin is because one, the engineering program was top 10 in the country. Uh, I believe it still is. And it was a great scholarship opportunity. I was fortunate enough to actually earn a full ride across the scholarships that I got. And so that was a huge consideration point that I, I hadn't seriously thought about previously because you know I was looking at all these you know, Ivy Leagues or private schools. I didn't get into the Ivy Leagues, but it was like, the, I know that that was, you know, the most expensive that I could have been looking at for college, but I didn't comprehend at the time, like what $60,000 a year looks like or $70,000 a year. So looking back, I'm so blessed that I chose the opportunity that had scholarship attached to it. Uh, and then the third component was the speech team. Uh, I did speech and debate all throughout high school. That was what I loved the most. I looked forward to speech tournaments every single weekend and I, I 
was sad when there weren't speech tournaments on weekends. Like I loved it. And so I wanted to keep doing that in college and UT's speech and debate program at the time was top three in the country. So it was a great pull in that way. But the funny thing is I did not ever expect to end up at a, an in-state school. Like of the uh, 24 colleges I applied to, I think like 18 of them were out of state. I desperately wanted to get out of Texas. At least I thought I did. But what I really wanted was just to have some period of my life where I was independent from Dallas and independent from, you know, the life and the parents that I'd always known. And being in Austin was far enough away from Dallas that I was able to live out that desire. Um, and that's how I ended up at UT. Wow. I... I, I thought the most I've heard of someone applying was 14, but 24, that definitely, yeah, <laughs> that definitely takes the cake. Oh, wow. It was, it was um, a lot. I have to say, so did you end up, um, you know, continuing, you were super involved with like theater and speech and debate. Did you end up also like continue to pursue that at UT? Or I know you kind of started with like your whole fitness journey throughout college as well. Yeah, yeah. So I continued with speech and debate for about the first year and a half. I did it all the way through my first year, my freshman year. And the speech team ended up getting second in the nation that year, which is the best that we had done in like almost a decade, I think, if not more than a decade. It was like an incredible year. We had some of the most talented performers I've ever seen in my life. Um, and for, if, if you're not familiar, speech and debate isn't just debate, it's speech too. And that means like competitive acting. It means writing speeches on a topic to either persuade or inform, things like that. And so my best event was informative speaking. That was the event that I got to take to nationals my freshman year. And so that was definitely a huge piece of, of my life my freshman year. The problem was it was actually disproportionately large for what I wanted it to be. It was such a massive time commitment that I wasn't able to put the time into things like fitness that I wanted to. And I wasn't able to find a social life much outside of speech and debate. It was, it was a massive time commitment. And that's why I ended up leaving the team midway through my sophomore year. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what I did uh, transitioning from high school to college in that way. Okay, yeah. And so you mentioned that you obviously took a lot of time and so you wouldn't have had the time probably to have started training for American Ninja Warrior, which I like. I remember you kind of doing that throughout college. But then can you talk to me about, I guess, like your general fitness journey? I mean, I know now like you have your own program, you coach people. I know throughout the YouTube channel, you also kind of post like transition, I mean, sorry, transformations of like of people that have done your program. But how did you first come to get super involved with fitness? Yeah, so it goes back to the same Batman story. Like it, it that inspired so many aspects of my life, not just the theater pursuits. It was like in the movie Batman Begins, I saw Batman drop to the ground and do push-ups. and 10 year old or nine year old me thought that that was so cool that I needed to do the same uh, to get stronger. So I literally started doing push-ups every single day at the age of nine uh, in 2005. Like that was just a thing. And as I did that more and more, I wanted to know how to make it more optimal or like optimize my own training. So I looked up videos from like an army master fitness trainer named Ken Weikert. I was learning different push-up varieties. I started adding sit-ups in my regimen. So for like five years, every single day, I was just doing push-ups and sit-ups. Um, the, the problem is that the, the other reason for doing that was rooted kind of in an insecurity. It was like, I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't necessarily like what I saw and I didn't like how I felt. And that's kind of a, a sucky situation to be in as a 10 year old. And I don't think that's something that, you know, any 10 year old should have to go through, but for whatever reason, that's what I was feeling. And so that really fueled my fitness journey from a, a very young age. Uh, but because I was just doing push-ups and sit-ups, I wasn't seeing like the visual progress that I wanted to uh, as a young kid. So that brings me to like around the age of 15, I started doing other people's workout programs, uh, like full on 90 day programs and ended up like getting way stronger than I'd ever been before, but I still wasn't seeing any visual change. And that's because I didn't have really much of any understanding of how nutrition affected uh, my, you know, quote unquote gains. It's like, I grew up in a household where my mom was all about healthy eating. And so I knew what it meant to eat healthy, but I didn't know much more than that. Like how does the amount that you're eating or the ratios of proteins, carbs, fats, how do those things affect uh, the transformation you see? So around the age of 16 or 17, I actually got my own fitness coach. And he is the one who taught me a lot of like the foundational understanding I have of uh, resistance training, cardio, nutrition, macros, all of that. And that allowed me to put on, I think somewhere around like 16 pounds of muscle in that, that year after that. So 
at this time I'm now in high school and I'm finally starting to get like this little bit more confidence. Um, I still wasn't quite like the size that I wanted to be, but it was like I was definitely in a better spot than I was previously. Then if I get myself to the point in my story of college, um, I had continued putting on more muscle, even beyond like that initial 16 or so pounds. Um, I was getting stronger, but I was still only doing at-home workouts. I didn't mention that previously, but all of the workouts that I had done, whether the push-ups or sit-ups at the beginning or the full-on programs after that, all of them were done at home. And I didn't have, you know, a ton of equipment. I just had like maybe uh, up to 45 pound dumbbells and a pull-up bar and resistance bands. And so then when I get to college, I try out the gym and I just feel completely lost. I have no idea how to use anything. I felt like everyone was bigger and stronger and knew what they were doing. And it, it was just intimidating. Um, and so I didn't feel comfortable in that environment. And then you combine that with like the overwhelm of college as a freshman, I just felt way too busy. I felt like there was no chance I could fit fitness into my life. So I completely stopped working out for like six months. And I then got into like this very unenergetic state where I, I was like in the worst shape I'd been in, at least in a very long time. Um, and, and now it was like, I didn't like the way I looked again, uh, but just in a different way, because now it's like body recomposition in the wrong direction, like less muscle, a little bit more fat. I wasn't overweight by any means, but it was like, again, I just didn't like the way that I looked or felt. So once more, I got a fitness coach and he plugged me into like an online uh, accountability group. And it was like a support system that I needed. And I finally had kind of started pairing together some of the, the fitness programs that I'd been following with my own research of how to use the gym, how to use like various equipments, barbells, dumbbells, machines. So for the next 90 days, I was like 100% perfect with my pursuits of fitness. And what I mean by that is I worked out at least six times a week, every single week. I tracked my calories every single day and I put on like another 12 or 13 pounds. I can't remember the exact amount, but I got in shape to a point where I was genuinely like confident in my body. I liked the way it looked. I liked the way I felt. I felt stronger. And it had such a profound impact on like my confidence in myself and my like everything in the, the area of fitness that I just thought to myself, like there is nothing that has been more powerful in my life than fitness. And the, if I look back at, you know, all the way back to nine, 10 years old, when I, I first looked at myself in the mirror and didn't like what I saw and I compare myself to the present where like, I'm genuinely happy with what I see and what I feel if I can help others go through that same transformation, there just wouldn't be anything more rewarding than that. And that is what ultimately led me to become a fitness coach um, that I still am to this day. Wow, that's, that's a very, that's a very inspiring story. And I love to see now that you, you know, you're taking all that passion and I'm sure the help that you had from your own fitness coaches, I know they probably, probably like influence you from such so early on and it's great to hear that um you know that now you have your own program i feel like i've seen so many different pictures and like transformations from people about how many people would you say that you've trained so far so just over the last two and a half years i've worked with over 500 clients on 15 countries on six continents wow so, yeah it's it's grown like crazy it's been awesome um the, the the reason why i say that's just over the last two and a half years is because i did do fitness coaching in the three years prior to that Okay. And in that time, I probably worked with like around 200 people, but that wasn't through my own company. That was through um, a different company that was not using my own program. So I wasn't as passionate about it. I didn't feel as confident with it. Um, but yeah, just, you know, over 500 in the last two and a half years. Wow. And do you do all that training yourself or do you have other people as well that kind of help you make these workouts or other trainers as well to kind of check in on everyone? So it's actually 100% me. Uh, wow. I, have, I have designed every program from square one. Um, I, I didn't use anyone else's program as like a hard baseline or anything. It was just like my understanding of the current scientific literature, as well as my own experiences um, combined together to make custom workout programs and meal plans. The thing that I want to emphasize though, is it's not like I'm working on 500 people's stuff at any given moment. It's like, that's over time. Right. I would say in any given moment, I'm probably working with some around 40 clients. Wow. Yeah. And it's all online. So none of these are in-person sessions, all online. Mm -hmm. And are your workouts also curated more for, you know, someone that's like a novice for the gym or are they also kind of like home workout things as well? Yeah, so they're completely customized on a variety of factors. So I have 
I have a massive variety of clients too. Like it's crazy to think like the youngest client I've ever worked with is 13. The oldest client I've ever worked with is 68. Wow. I've worked with, you know, men, women, moms, dads, athletes, former athletes, uh, professionals, moms, dads, like whatever you can think of, I've probably worked with them. And I'm very proud of that because that goes to show like just how customizable these programs are. So it's the type of thing where whether your goals are shredding fat, building muscle, gaining strength, recomposing your body, just building your own confidence, building your awareness of how to use things in the gym, all of those things can be accomplished with the program. And that's because it isn't just a cookie cutter program. Mm -hmm. A lot of programs out there, like, you know, you just go and you click buy and it sends you the program and that's it. But with me, you fill out a full client questionnaire. I'm taking into account all these different factors about, you know, what your goals are, your past history, um, your schedule and availability. You know, like some of my clients, they have all the time in the world. They can work out six days a week. Others are super busy and maybe they can only work out three or four days a week. So I take all of those into account. And then in terms of the experience level, because it's customized, even within a given program, I can make something more or less advanced. But I, I would say across all of the clients I've worked with, very few of them have ever started with anything besides my first program. Uh, for context, I have the Lion Shred, Lion Shred 2.0, Lion Shred 3.0, uh, the Women's Specialization Program, and the Lion Shred at Home. So it's like five different program offerings. And that allows me to curate based on like your level. But like I said, almost every single person starts with the lion shred because even if you are advanced, I've had people working out, you know, four plus years who start with the first program and they're like, I knew how to do, you know, like a lot of these things, but I never did them in the way that you're having me do them. And it made so much difference. And so like that has shown me that people who haven't followed a structured systematic program uh, they get benefit regardless of what their experience level is. So that's been a, a really cool learning for me. Wow, that's awesome. Well, well, and what was the inspiration then? So I know you've, um, so obviously like your, your program focuses on working out, sorry, like on exercise, all of those sorts of things, but did you kind of start that, I guess, like with your YouTube? Like can you talk to me about your YouTube channel then? What was the inspiration, I guess, for starting that? Yeah, so the YouTube channel started, I guess, a full year before I ever launched my own program. I was already doing fitness coaching through the other company uh, at that time, but I, I didn't like fully link the two yet. Um, basically, starting in 2016, so about a year after I started fitness coaching for the other company, I, I was doing Facebook Live videos, and I would go live on Facebook every week talking about various fitness and nutrition topics. And... I was getting like a decent viewership just from like the people I knew personally on Facebook to where like at least 200 people were watching every week. And that was like a really cool thing. And occasionally people would comment or message me like, Patrick, this is really cool content. You should consider like, you know, starting a YouTube channel. Maybe you could reach even more people that way. And I said like that had always been a cool idea to me, but I didn't know how to do YouTube. Like I didn't know how to film or edit a video. All I knew how to do was like turn on my phone and click live. Um, and so luckily a friend of mine reached out and said that he would teach me how to edit. And it literally only took like an hour or two. And I knew like pretty much everything I needed to, to know how to edit videos. So the very first video I put out was my own transformation story, basically from like age nine to, I think it was 22 or 21 at the time. Um, and so I put out that first video and it kind of set this marker of like fitness toward my YouTube channel. But the problem was I still didn't know what I wanted the rest of my videos to be. Um, and when I was thinking about like, how do I decide what my content should be? Mm -hmm. The mindset I came that I approached it with was, I feel like not everyone is ready to get fit right now or to like get into fitness, but everyone wants to be entertained. So if I can entertain an audience first, maybe then I can like weave in fitness or I can eventually talk about fitness. And so what I started doing was basically pranks and social experiments and social interactions that in some way or another incorporated fitness. So like the very, the second video that I ever put out was called like the hundred dollar push-up challenge or the hundred dollar push-up contest. And I would just go up to strangers and like literally on sixth street and say like, Hey, do you want to do a push-up contest? If you win, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And it's just like a weird fun thing to do. And so a bunch of people said yes. And so the whole video is just me doing all these push-up contests. Um, 
And like, that was a ton of fun for me. I'd never done anything like it. It was super nerve wracking because I did it in like more of a prank style where like the camera was far enough away that like the people I was talking to didn't know at the beginning that it was a, like a filmed interaction. It was more so just like, who's this random stranger asking if I want to do a push-up contest. And so then I started just doing more prank videos, uh, similar in concept. Um, and it was just like so much fun for me. And I was still doing all the Facebook Live videos. So Facebook Live was where I was like going, you know, deep into the, con the concepts of fitness. And then my YouTube channel was just like my entertainment platform. And then, you know, fast forwarding years later, what I have intentionally done is I've maintained YouTube as my entertainment platform. Because again, I still feel like that's how you can hold people's attention the longest is, you know, solely entertainment, but I always weave in fitness in, in some way. So uh, while I was at UT, I did a lot of videos like in the PCL or in classrooms and I would be dressed up as like Batman or a T-Rex. And even though I was in like these absurd costumes, I was still doing push-ups in costume because then it's like fun, weird, quirky prank, but fitness is still there at least a little bit. Um, and, and I think that has served me well. I don't know if it, if it wouldn't have, if it would have gone as well, if I, uh, had not done all the fitness stuff with it, but what I have done is I tried to funnel my audience over to my Instagram, which is my business platform. And on Instagram is where I directly talk about the lion tread and the fitness science behind things. And, um, ultimately hopefully get people to sign up for the program and commit to their health and fitness. Wow, amazing. And I know uh, when I was looking through your channel, seeing also you post, you, you posted a lot when you're preparing for American Ninja Warrior. So I want to ask you about that. How did you first, I guess, like become interested in participating? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I mentioned that I was doing the Facebook Live stuff and somewhere around like the, I think the nine or 10 month mark of doing Facebook Live, I posted I was also posting videos and pictures of like my own fitness transformation and my own like new abilities with like cool fitness tricks. And one of the videos I posted was of me doing 10 muscle ups. And if you're not familiar with a muscle up, it's basically like you do a pull up and then you end up on top of the bar. Like you swing yourself all the way on top. Uh, it kind of looks like a gymnastics move or a calisthenic movement. And it is like a rather advanced move that I used to just not be able to do at all. And in that video, I did 10 in a row and that was like huge accomplishment for me. So I got like good positive feedback. And one of the comments was from my sister and it said, Patrick, this is awesome. Uh, you should consider applying for American Ninja Warrior. And I was like, that would be cool, but I have absolutely no idea how to do that. <laughs> and she just sent me a link to the application and it was as simple as that. So uh, I had always thought about doing it or wanting to do it as a kid, because I, I grew up watching it on G4, and it was just called Ninja Warrior then, not American Ninja Warrior. Um, but it wasn't until years later that I like actually understood what it might take in terms of physical ability. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I should do this. I should try and actually go for what I had aspired to do as a kid. Um, and again, this is before I had started my own YouTube channel. So I didn't know how to edit videos. And luckily, uh, a friend named Andrew Cordova offered to help me film and edit a video. Um, and so we met up at Clark Field and we basically filmed all of the dialogue of my audition video. And um, then I just sent him over a bunch of clips of me doing different fitness things. And that is what resulted in my first video application. So I sent it off and heard back from the casting producer a couple of weeks later. And he really liked my energy. He liked my story. He said the only thing missing was I didn't have any footage of myself in a ninja gym. And I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know that those existed. Uh, and he said, no, yeah, they're all over the place now. Like it's gotten pretty popular. So we definitely want to see you uh, on that. And I didn't have a car at the time. So I like hit up a bunch of friends to drive to San Antonio because that was the nearest ninja gym. There weren't any in Austin. So literally the very next weekend, I went to San Antonio. I filmed on the course. Uh, it was a super cool moment because I had never done obstacles before, but I was actually able to do them. And so I sent that footage over to the casting producer. He really liked it. And he forwarded it on to the executive producer who gets the final say in who makes it. Then like a month goes by, I don't hear anything. And so I call up the casting producer and I say, hey, is, uh, is there any updates? Do you know if I will or won't make it? And he said, unfortunately, if you haven't heard back, you probably did not make it. Um, and basically what he told me is he doesn't know why they do or don't choose to, to move forward with someone. But if he had to guess, it was because of my story. It wasn't that it wasn't a good story, it just wasn't good enough. It's like, if you think about reality TV, it's like you wanna pull at the heartstrings of America. And he said in my story, it was more like, oh, poor Patrick, you like almost failed a class and then you didn't. 
<laughs> um, and so I was like, okay, that's fair. So uh, instead of being on the show that year in 2017, I was a course tester. And that meant that I got to go to the real course the day before they actually filmed and test out the obstacles. So I was able to film that. And now I had footage of myself on like the real life Ninja Warrior course. Uh, I did decently well in like two of the three obstacles that I tried. And that was still cool because it was only the second time I'd ever done obstacles at all. And that was like a, a, a turning point moment for me because I realized just how badly I really wanted to do this. I was like, if I am like a total novice at Ninja and I just did two out of the three obstacles I tried, um, and I've already come this far, I have to do this. I really want to be on this show. And so I spent the next like 10 months getting in the best shape of my life, training as hard as I could, and also making a YouTube video every single week. And the reason why I tell, I mention that is because making it on Ninja Warrior isn't just about being strong and it isn't just about having a story. It's about a combination of both of those and being able to tell that story through video. So during that next like 10 months or so, I also landed my internship at Microsoft and that was like the final piece of my story that I thought that I needed. It was like, now I can position myself as like the nerdy kid who also wants to be on Ninja Warrior and is, you know, trying to build his body to a point of confidence, things like that. So I put all that together in my new audition video. This time I know how to edit. I knew the exact story I wanted to tell. I sent it off and I was accepted for season 10 of American Ninja Warrior in 2018. Amazing. Wow. And what was that like? How, where, like, where did you compete? Was it here in Texas or did you have to go out of state? Yeah. So it was actually in Dallas, which was awesome because that's where I'm from. I was in Austin at the time because this is like in the middle of my second to last semester of college. Um, so like I trained for the show uh, in Austin and at the time I got the call to the time uh, of competing, I had five weeks. So during those five weeks, I prioritized fitness and Ninja Warrior way, way, way more than I had prioritized school. <laughs> Uh, like I was training at ninja gyms two to three times a week. I was going to rock climbing gyms two to three times a week. I was still getting in like at least one workout weightlifting session a week. Like I was doing fitness like crazy. Um, and I genuinely got in like the new best shape of my life in those five weeks. And then I went to Dallas and it was just the most larger than life experience I've ever had. That's, that's the wording I always use when I, I describe it to people because it, that's just what it is. It's like a TV set production of like a big kid's jungle gym and you're just surrounded by the most fit people you've ever seen and the most athletically gifted people or, you know, athletically trained people you've ever seen. So there's all these like ninjas that, you know, I am familiar with because they've crusted on the, sh the show for, for so long and I know that I'm going to be competing against them. And then there's various parts where you're getting filmed, you get to look like a superhero, you're on like a rotating platform like you see before like a football game where people just like look like super big and cool and they're like posing in whatever way. And like it was it was super awesome and it, it was so cool to be there in that moment. And then the night of filming, I didn't run until five in the morning. I'd been up all night. Not like I just couldn't sleep. It's like literally they film from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. They film only in the nighttime hours because that allows them to edit the footage in any order. Because what I mean by that is like, if you started before sunset, then you would have to have the before sunset people in that specific order when you go back and edit the show for TV. So they start at 10 p.m., the sun is already down. Um, I was like 80 something in a row of like 100 people. So that put me around like 5 a.m. I was very tired, but I also had so much adrenaline because it's just like, there's so much energy in that, in that space. Um, and when I go up to run the course, it's like in the moment before I step up onto the platform to begin, it was like a wave of emotion came over me because it was like, I realized how special it was that I was there. Like how I had put in this work very intentionally because of a dream that I had and that like it actualized in that moment, it became something that it was real. Um, and that was just like very, very special. So uh, in that moment before, I'm like thinking about like how cool that is. And the, the, the story producer had told me to like roar before I go on because I have like a lion on my shirt. So I roar and then uh, I get like the three, two, one to begin. And then all of my, my energy is focused in on that moment. Um, one step back, bef right before the actual thing began, it was like, insane to look around because there's like lights and cameras everywhere there's an audience of a thousand people to my left you know there's water in front of me that like i could easily fall into there's all this stuff 
uh, and then I just have to like hone in on the moment of like, I have to do this. Um, so I made it through the first obstacle just fine. And then I'm like cheering, I'm looking at all my friends and family on the side who had come to support. Uh, and then in the second obstacle, I was fully capable of doing it, but I started to doubt myself. Um, it was like at the end or at the midpoint of the obstacle, I was basically on this, this bar and I just need to reach forward and grab another bar. And in that moment, it felt like it was like six feet away, like it was an impossible thing to reach. But when I went back and watched the footage, it was like three feet away. I could have literally like reached my arm out and touched it. Um, but for whatever reason, like because of how insane of a moment that was, how much pressure I'd put on myself and how much I wanted it, that kind of backfired. And so I fell in the water on the second obstacle after about 66 seconds, which was a bummer, but it was like, it didn't matter. Like what mattered is that I, I made it happen. I was there, I showed up, my friends and family were there. I had an amazing experience. I got the best of my life for it. All of it was uh, so, so rewarding. I loved it. Do you think you, do you think you'll make another appearance sometime? I definitely, I definitely hope to. I tried the following year and I actually thought my audition video and my abilities were way better than they were the, uh, the previous time, but for whatever reason, I didn't make it. And then this year because of coronavirus, uh, they've temporarily postponed it, um, but they're going to do it this year just with a much smaller uh, competitive pool. So they've already been selected. So hopefully next year, we will see. I'm excited to see it. Thank uh, you. Patrick, if I were if I were to guess, I mean, like if I hadn't met you earlier and just hearing about, you know, your fitness, your whole fitness journey, preparing for American Ninja Warrior, and then also, you know, working with clients, I would have to guess that you do this full time. But then I also remember it's like you also work at Microsoft. So then, I mean, I have to ask, like, did you ever consider maybe just like full sending, like just just doing a fitness, like having that as your career? Or I guess like what ultimately led you to want to continue also with your mechanical engineering background, with your engineering background in general, and go on to work for Microsoft? Yeah, so to be completely transparent, I absolutely did think about just doing the fitness stuff. And I actually did do the fitness stuff full time for six months before ever going to Microsoft. And this is a very intentional thing. It was like, I could have started working at Microsoft in January of last year. And I chose to postpone that all the way until July of that year. So it gave me six months that Theoretically, I could have done nothing. I could have just, you know, sat around and did nothing. But I, I wanted to use that time to experiment with what, what life would look like if I was my own business owner and I solely worked for myself. And it was like the best six months of my life because I got to work on what I was passionate about. I was working with clients. I was helping people with their own bodies and their transformations. I got to travel the world. I like went to Europe during that time. I went on like a vacation to Sao Padre. I had never been there before. Um, I, I traveled to Oklahoma City for American Ninja Warrior to support my friends who were on it. I got to do all these things that I wouldn't have been able to do were I, you know, working for a corporation. And what that more importantly allowed me to do was to scale my business during that time. Mm -hmm. Because by putting in so much time for six months, by the time I got to Microsoft, I had scaled it, made it efficient enough to the point where I could keep doing all of it and work at Microsoft. The caveat I will put to that is I didn't prepare as well as I had hoped. I was only getting about six hours of sleep a night by the time I uh, was doing both. And I'm used to getting eight hours of sleep a night. And especially with me caring about health and fitness, that was a really sucky situation to be in because it's like, I knew that I needed more sleep, but I also knew I had to do Microsoft and I wanted to do Lion Shred. So that was difficult for the first half year that I worked at Microsoft. And then once it was getting to like the new year mark and I was reflecting on things I needed to change, sleep was a big one. And so I reprioritized and said I had to get at least seven hours of sleep, but ideally seven and a half to, to eight. And just that simple reprioritization is all that I really needed. And basically for the entirety of this year so far, I've gotten on average seven and a half hours of sleep. And it wasn't that I had to cut out like Microsoft or I had to cut out Lionshare to do that. It was just, I found all the places that I was wasting time. Um, I know I'm kind of going on a tangent, but I, I just like telling this story. I realized that the thing that caused me to waste the most time was sitting down on my bed at the end of a long day. Because as soon as I sat down, it was like all momentum was lost and all of my desire to do anything was lost because I immediately got comfortable. I would watch a YouTube video and then I would fall into like the pit hole of just watching tons and tons of YouTube videos the same way someone might do the same with like Netflix. Um, and so I just told myself, okay, I can't sit down on my bed at the end of a long day. And as soon as I did that, I had so much more time to work on my own stuff and still get seven and a half hours of sleep. Um, so that's how I do both. I just had to really 
cut out the 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 excess things in my life and i have to ask so now that you kind of have been able to balance everything out so much better but um um do you think you'd ever see yourself just completely committing more to your company or do you think you'll always kind of want to do both manage your company but also work for another corporation as well yeah so at some point in the future i, I definitely could see myself doing my own business full-time like um it's an incredibly rewarding thing to work for yourself and uh, like I said, those six months were some of the best of my life, and I'm, I don't regret those at all. I love that I allowed myself to get a taste of what that life is like. And so now it's like on a daily basis, even though I'm you know, working at Microsoft, doing the best that I can there, I'm also spending time on the Lion Tread and now on my, my new segment of that business endeavor called the Online Coach Academy. I'm working on those two things every single day um, because I know that investing time into my own equity in a way is a way to kind of scale for the future. Um, and I love it. I love doing it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, that pretty much wraps up all the questions that I had on my end, but one, but I have one last and very important question. So as you know, like our whole purpose for this podcast is to inspire students, whether they're aspiring to pop, like potentially work in Microsoft headquarters, or maybe they also are having some difficulty and want to go on like their own fitness journey, just don't know where to start. But if you had any words that you wanted to share to our audience or any just piece of advice or knowledge, now's your time to share a little message. Yeah. So I think that one quote that I have lived by is from Steve Jobs. And it says, if today were the last day of my life, what I want to do, what I'm about to do today. And Steve Jobs' approach was if he woke up and asked himself that question and the answer was no for too many days in a row, he would simply change what he was doing. And so the, the way that I generalize that to my own life and the way that I hope that others generalize it to theirs is make sure that you're doing something that you actually care about. And that actually is like moving your life in the direction that you want. If you find yourself doing things that you're not happy with, or you're not happy with some element of your life, it's so crucial to identify that because life is too short to spend your time doing things that you don't enjoy. Um, yes, there are, you know, nuances to that. Like there are times where you will have to do things that you don't want to do, but you want to be working towards a life that is what you want it to be. Um, and I think a big part of what gets you there is habits uh, because Another quote that I like is from John C. Maxwell, and he says that successful people have a willingness to do what unsuccessful people do not. And what I think that means is that if you, whatever way you define success, I define success as happiness, happiness, fulfillment, and health while helping others. That's my definition of success. So to be successful, you have to be willing to do the things that maybe you don't always want to do. But doing those things will allow you to do the things you care the most about. And so when I think of, of times where like, quote unquote, the going gets rough, it's, it's so necessary to keep doing the things that will get you closer to your goals. So whether you're tired or whether you've had a long day, finding the ways in which you can practice daily habits that will get you just an inch closer to whatever it is you want to do. Because if you just spend, you know, five or 10 minutes doing something every single day, by the time you've reached the end of the year, you've spent like 40 to 50 hours doing that five to 10 minute action compounded over the year. So uh, practice daily habits, make sure that you are doing things that are getting you close to your goals and don't accept a life that you're doing things you don't enjoy. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me. I had such a great time and I hope that you did as well. Thank you so much, Melissa, I had a blast. Great, well, Melissa signing off. Thank you so much for joining Patrick. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.